Good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to the annual meeting. It is that time of the year. And by the way, happy, happy birthday. It's our 30th anniversary. It's, it's amazing uh, that we have already been a society for 30 years. Yes, please. Uh, first of all, I have to uh, give some thanks uh, first to the attendees because you make the meeting. Without you, there is no purpose. Uh, two, uh, to the speakers, the faculty really make the, the program. To the great uh, program co-chairs and scientific program committee, uh, I think that you will enjoy the program this year. They have done a fantastic job and recruiting many of you uh, as faculty members. I also want to, to thank uh, our exhibitors and corporate sponsors, uh, our administrative partners, BSC, and uh, last but not least, I want to thank my family uh, for all their support this year, my wife, Sylvia and Katerina, that are in the audience. So, thank you. Uh, I want to, before we start uh, the, the presentation, uh, I would like to have some housekeeping announcements. Uh, first of all, uh, please visit our exhibitors, our corporate partners, without their help, this meeting would not be possible, uh, so please go by their booths and thank them uh, for their support. Uh, I want to also uh, promote that we are in social media. I don't know if you have realized, realized it, but we are in Twitter. So if you have a Twitter account, by all means, uh, hashtag NASBS. And if you're not in Twitter account, uh, please consider signing in. Uh, the welcome reception will be this afternoon at six o'clock, and following the opening ceremony, we're gonna have our business meeting. So if you're a member of the society, please go on and get your lunch and come back to this room uh, for the business meeting. If you're not a member, you, are well, you will have lunch uh, at the exhibitor uh, hall. So without any more ado, uh, if I can have my, my slides, please. So as you can see here, uh, the theme for, that I picked is a, is a rapid evolution of healthcare. We're all being affected by this, and I think it's an appropriate uh, thing to, to consider, an appropriate subject to consider. Uh, there's change is just part of life. Actually, change is the law of life, and change is what brings us the future. So we have to accept change. The, the speed of change that we're seeing nowadays is, is dramatic. However, humanity has seen other periods of rapid change. Uh, for example, you can see here that in a period of 40 to 30 years, uh, we basically develop everything that we consider icons of civilized life. So trains, planes, automobiles, the, the, the telephone, electricity, etc. What happens since then, though, is that all these items have changed very little, have been somewhat stable. So what we have nowadays is a period that not only we have rapid change, but we have continuous acceleration. These changes that we see today are not gonna be stable for 80 years. They're gonna be changing continuously from now on. So I have a little to-do list uh, of what uh, changes are upon us. I'm gonna, I'm gonna share some reflections on this, this uh, subject. What is forcing us to get there? And what, what is there? Because the there may be different from all of us. So before I take you into my rabbit hole, I have to give you a disclaimer. Uh, this is completely biased on my, on my own perspective. Uh, I'm not pretend to give you a comprehensive review, and I don't pretend to give you uh, all-encompassing solutions to uh, these problems that we face nowadays. So what I want to make you is more aware of some of the things that were uh, entertaining in life uh, and maybe let, make you think a little bit about these changes and how can we impact the changes. We're seeing uh, changes dri driven by multiple things in our internal and external environment. Some of them are changes by design, and some of them are changes that happen spontaneously or by luck. Some of them are voluntary, some of them are imposed upon us. And nonetheless, some of these changes, as you see in, in here, uh, could be considered for the better, some of these changes it may be more controversial, may be considered not really for the best. 
So in, in both in our work environment and in our society, we see more diversity, but we also see more polarization. We have multiple gaps happening in both at the workplace and society. Generation gaps, gender gaps, cultural gaps, and that brings friction. Uh, this is the, one of the first, yeah, I think it is the first time in history that we actually have five generations, five generations working in the same place, and we complain a lot about each other. So older generations, we complain about, about the work ethic, the lack of motivation by the younger generation. The younger generation complains that the older generation doesn't get it. They don't want to change. They're on the way. That basically, they don't understand their, what motivates the new generation. This is what I call the American dream paradox. It's, if you observe history in, in the last few hundred years, we know that in, in the US and maybe many other parts of the world, every generation wants to do better than the last one. And actually every parent wants their children to do better than what they did. However, somehow every generation believes that the next generation may not up to the task, that they have a problem, that we're not happy with them. And yet every generation is a product of all the generations before them. So how are we gonna solve this? Again, I don't have a, a big solution for this, and I don't want to make it oversimplistic. But as I see this, I see the new generation, the younger people, wanting to make an impact. That's what motivates them. So it may not be power, it may not be money. They just want to make a change. They want to be part of that change. Perhaps the main problem that we see as an older generation when we look at them is their lack of impatience, or the lack of patience. They are impatient. They want to get there immediately. They see because of the media and other things, how uh, the, the information is diffusing throughout the world. They may see successes that they may think they are instantaneous, but they are not. So if you want to get to that summit, you have to realize that it takes skills, it takes many steps, it takes many falls, and you have to stand up again. It takes time, it takes effort, and it takes help from other people. It takes a team, it takes guidance. And we have to be honest, sometimes it takes a little bit of luck. So you will realize that once you get to that summit, to that peak, there are other summits to go. This is not the end of the road. So to success, you, you should see it as improving day by day, year by year. And it takes time to do it. There's no fixed de destination. There is no timeline to do it. You have to realize that this is something that you will face, and every generation has faced. Change, people are, are really reluctant to change. There will be friction, there will be stress, there will be a lot of naysayers, uh, and you will have to keep your way, keep your path, keep your direction. To the older generation, we have three choices as we face these changes. We can try to put obstacles on the way. We are the ones who are in a position of authority. We're in a position of, of being the rulers in many organizations, in government, et cetera. So we are, we are able to some degree to do this. Or we can embrace the change. You can embrace it and be just a passive user. You can be an active user, participate in, in the change. Or you can innovate, actually be a catalyst on these changes and welcome these changes. I hope that most of us will, will pick at least to be a, an embracer or an innovator. Things that are on the way. I, I would encourage, especially the younger generation, to question dogmas. Uh, I think that we worry a, a lot about these two at the top, the known unknowns and the unknown unknowns, and trying to fix them, trying to get more knowledge. But I'm actually more worried about the things that we think we know the known knowns, especially in surgery, we have a lot of dogmas that have been passed from generation to generation with no valid science behind them. Just because my mentor did it this way, I will continue doing it that way uh, for generations to come, and you will have to do it this way, otherwise you are considered a, her her a heresy uh, and you will be burned at the stake. So question dogmas, question why we do things, and be very cognizant of false first impressions. So sometimes what you see is really not 
uh, what it is. Uh, doubt yourself. So if you indulge me for a second, let's look at this video. Many of you, I'm sure, have seen this video before. So try to count how many passes the white shirts are having. So how many? Any volunteers? 13. Yes, you are correct. However, did you see the moonwalking bear? So it, this brings into it, yes, many of you have seen it. Uh, many of you will see it. About 50% of you will, will see the walking bear. And 50% won't. Uh, the reason I'm bringing that up is, is that awareness. You, you, if you focus into something, you will always see what you want to see. Uh, so again, be aware that this can be a problem. You will miss uh, the panoramic picture if you are too focused. So again, uh, for the, 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 all these events that you see listed here were unintended discoveries, meaning that the inventors or the discoverers were not really looking for that solution. We're not really looking for, for this invention. Uh, there are many Nobel Prizes won on these inventions. Yet, this is not entirely a matter of luck. All these inventors and discoverers uh, had in common that they were able to connect events in their life to this particular discovery. And by, have, by doing that, they were prepared for that discovery. They were prepared to open that door when the door presented itself. From the skull basis standpoint, I have lived through two major changes in oncologic surgery, the soft frontal approach um, we started, and later on, the endoscopic approach, that are basically the end result of that, seeing connections between one and the other. However, uh, from my standpoint, again, we go to the team concept. Uh, from my standpoint, the greatest, the greatest advance in skull-based surgery in the last 30 years is this, is the formation of teams, multi-specialty teams, which is really what the society is about. And I think that it has contributed more to advance uh, skull-based surgery and other specialties than anything else, than any device, any technique that we have done. So this is the mission statement of the North American Skull Base, and I'm not going to repeat it. You can look it up. It's in our website. And it's basically uh, the foundation of these primary goals, which are the same primary goals that we have as physicians and academicians and surgeons and whatever else we do. We have clinical care, academic mission, research, innovation, community service, and economics. So let's expound on some of this and how the, the changes are impacting all, all these aspects. Forces at play. We have forces due to the market. We live in a capitalist system, and the market uh, rules some of the changes that we, we have nowadays, technological changes, regulatory changes, and medical legal. I'm not going to talk on the last two. I'm going to concentrate mostly on the market. I don't mean to give you a, a lesson in economics, but this is some, a simple graph that basically describes the capitalist system, which is what we have and seems to be working very well for us. So we have demand and supply. You have a buyer and a, and a supplier. And basically, they reach an equilibrium uh, basically made uh, by price. So price somehow regulates the market in such a way that the allocation of resources is very uh, functional and is very efficient. So just imagine that you're going to buy any, any a product to the store where you actually do not understand what you're buying. You don't get what you're getting. You don't know what you're going to get. Uh, the product is being produced by a company that is regulated by the people that are not the employees and not the owners. And it really won't matter too much because you are not actually paying directly to that, that supplier. So that's a very dysfunctional market. And that's really what we have in healthcare. So we have patients that don't know what they need. They don't understand what they're getting. Uh, we have a lot of third parties that are regulating what we can give them, how we can give it, and how much. And they're not paying directly to the supplier. So there is a, a, a moral hazard in all this. So the so-called invisible hand cannot work its magic in the healthcare system. The stakeholders are much more augmented from the, uh, the ideal stakeholders in, a, in a, the market that I showed you before. 
uh, you have listed in, in, this, uh, in this slide. And basically, it's very hard to keep everybody happy uh, because they go in different directions. They have different wants and different needs. So again, I don't, don't, do not pretend to give you a big solution how we're going to solve this. But we have some certain things that we can identify that for, for, to sustain a healthy healthcare system, we have to improve access, we have to reduce waste, we have to continue to deliver a high quality of care, uh, we have to direct technological innovations in a way that are practical and are useful. Uh, to have technological innovations that are expensive and it really doesn't make it too much of a difference it is really not productive. And we have to contain the high cost of new treatments like the ones listed here. Something, a trend that we have been seeing in the last year, the last couple of years maybe, is that it has been identified that our healthcare doesn't have a value line. So we don't have a Southwest Airlines that reduces cost. We don't have a Costco that has a known markup for what they deliver. We don't have an Uber, a Lyft, or a Didi that transport people, people with a click of a button. At least, not yet. This is in development. We have also seen the entry of, of equity firms into the healthcare market. And I don't know how you, th how you think about this, but regardless of you see it as an opportunity, as a challenge, or, or as a threat, they will definitely are here, and they will definitely accelerate the change. So aside from the market, we have technological forces that are forcing changes up upon us. Uh, I'm not going to be able to discuss all of this here, but I want to, to discuss mostly the cognifying, which is everything is becoming smarter. All of a sudden, your coffee maker has an IQ higher than you. So let, let's look at what is happening with the, ga the games, which is a good analogy or, or a good way of looking at artificial intelligence. So you, have this, you see here that in the 1950s, a computer was able to defeat a human in tic-tac-toe. And in 1997, Big Blue, in, in a big uh, marketed and a very visible way, defeated Gary Gaspar Kas Kasparov, which was the chess master at that time. And that, that, was mar that marked like a big milestone in artificial intelligence. And then you have uh, computers that have defeated Jeopardy, uh, learned to play Atari. This is not really just they learn it. Uh, the, the deep mind that definitely uh, defeated the Go Master. So for those of you who are not familiar with Go, this is uh, a game that is played mainly in Asia uh, and is much more complex than chess. The calculations that you have to go, that you have to have in Go, are, are incredible. And some scientists had calculated that a computer would not be able to defeat a Go master until 2030. However, you can see here that in 2016, a computer was able to defeat it. And basically, the goal of this game is you have to surround your enemy, which is, of course, is the the, the opposite color on the board. And then if, if we thought that this was going to be very advanced, and then they came up with Alpha Zero, and this is from the DeepMind company, which is a Google enterprise. So in Alpha Zero, it's a different algorithm that basically they give Alpha Zero uh, a, the rules of a game, and Alpha Zero start playing with itself until it learns how to play the game. And you can see here that in less than a month, not, not only Alpha Zero was able to defeat the humans, but was able to defeat any other computer software that was existing. So the same algorithm was applied to shogi, which is actually Japanese chess. The difference between the usual chess is that you keep the, your opponent uh, piece on the board, and it becomes yours. So again, more complexity. And they were able to defeat, of course, the chess. So the difference here is that basically by giving the rules of anything, the computer will be able to figure it out. So big difference in calculation of power. From AlexaNet, uh, which is what Amazon uses, of course, to, to manage Alexa, to AlphaGo Zero, is a 300,000 increase in calculation power, computational power. So why, why are we so surprised by this? Is that, again, our intuition on what the future is going to be is linear. This is Ray Kurzweil, uh, that nowadays is the chief of engineering at Google. And he's a futurist. He has a fantastic record of predictions. 
I think from the 1995 to now, he has predicted 120 uh, events, of which 80% of them have happened. So good batting average. And it explains very well our surprise with all these changes. Something that we, we thought it, it was unique to humankind. Well, the computer can do this or can do that, but the computer cannot create. It cannot be creative. So that will, has been proven wrong again. By the use of GAN, Generative Adversarial Networks, uh, the computer can actually be, become very creative. Let me give you an example of this. This is two years ago. The computer was able to defeat all the players around the world playing Dota 2, which is a war game. And you can imagine that it requires a lot of creativity to come up with different solutions uh, during this game. And the computer was able to do it. Again, very big milestone. So what are we facing? Is this really a threat? Is this really something we need? Is this really something that we, we can use? Oh, I think that definitely we can use it. Look at what is happening to knowledge. So we have been doubling knowledge in a way that it was kind of flat. And then you have this exponential growth of knowledge to the point that now in 2020, basically we double the amount of knowledge that human being will accumulate it since we were created uh, every 11 to 12 hours. Twice a day, we double the amount of knowledge that uh, we have accumulated throughout, uh, throughout our history. From the medicine standpoint, uh, we, did, we do need data analytics. We are seeing this in our hospitals. We have different dashboards that follow different parameters. And of course, we are in the era of omics, genomics, radiomics, etc., that hopefully will help us to figure out many of the problems that we have. Paradoxically, uh, all these changes that are happening take some time to diffuse. Diffusion of innovation actually doesn't happen in a linear way. As you can see here, we have a bell curve, and if you look at the innovators, a very small percentage, uh, and you look at the early adopters, and we have uh, what they call the chasm. So the chasm is that period where you need an adoption of at least 16 to 17% to go on to the big part of the bell curve, which is this, uh, that is the early majority and the late majority. If you cannot pass the chasm, whatever innovation it is, is going to die. In medicine, so once we pass the chasm, again, 17%, it takes about 15 to 17 years for every innovation diffuse into 50% 50, 50 of the users. So if you come up with some robotic technique, it will, come, it will, it will take about 15 years for 50% of the surgeons to adopt it. So we have a little bit of a lag in adoption. This is the hype cycle, the Gardner hype cycle. And basically, this is how technology triggers. And then uh, you have an inflated expectation. You have what they call the trough of disillusionment. But you realize that it's not going to be as good as you thought. And you have to work on it a little bit more. And you get to the slope of enlightenment. And you can, I'm not going to dwell too much on this. But basically, you can follow every innovation. You can see things like artificial technology, like self-driverless self, uh, driverless, uh, cars, et cetera, et cetera, 3D printing, how they have gone through the cycle from 2014 to what we have right now. Some of these innovations have died. Some of them have passed into the, the, the uh, slope of enlightenment. So knowledge, we have another problem. I told you already that the knowledge is accumulating, but at the same time, it's turning over. So the validity of knowledge is shorter and shorter and shorter. So this is not affecting just medicine. It's affecting every, every aspect of life, physics, economic, math, psychology. You can see here that knowledge has a half-life that you can measure. For us surgeons, we live more or less in this realm. Uh, we have to take, uh, you, we need actionable knowledge, and we have to take action most of the time, here, we have to take action in seconds. It's very difficult to take action immediately or to be completely predictive of what is going to happen. So the computers are going to help us with this. So we have this complex interaction of forces, what translate into we have an information overload where we have new knowledge that is being created every second uh, that is impossible to, to really uh, absorb. 
We have a lot of faults of inaccurate data that we cannot really discern. We have a very fast turnover of even the actionable items. And this actionable information that we need, we're slow on adopting it. So we do need the help of a computer to do that. We, there are some changes in this respect that we see every day. There are no, new entrants and digital information. You can see here the amount of investment that is coming in, in this regard. Uh, the, the different validated uh, items are common validated by the FDA in, in regards of specific health outcomes and the in, increased use of connected health services. We, we see this, we see it in our everyday wearable devices, right? That we can use to follow our health, that we can use to follow metrics that we have in our patients. And of course, supercomputers as they come in, AI, quantum computers, will help us to find the most effective treatment, looking at all this data. So we will continue to go from a reactive medicine to preemptive, to predictive, to personalize. And this is not, again, a linear, a linear curve, but we are getting, we're going in that direction. The bottom line, computers are smarter than humans. Uh, you, AI and uh, machine learning are here to stay. You can see here that in two years, about one of every five health workers will depend on AI for their job. AI will eliminate two million jobs, but it will create more than two million jobs. They will be different. Everybody will have to upskill, including you and me. So we'll have to be prepared for this. So Watson, the descend direct descendant of Big Blue, the one that defeated Kasparov, in the 1990s, has cross-training an MD, I have to say with mixed results. It depends what they use it for. Uh, it will be more or less effective. There have been some major flops with it, especially uh, when they use it for cancer care. However, hybrids still beat computers. There's some hope for us. We're not gonna be eliminated. And this is without counting the things that are coming down the future, like things like Neuralink. That may seem like science fiction, but if you read a little bit more about it, this is something that is real, is common, and it will be here before you know it. So interacting, another technological force that is rapidly changing us, is we have maximum engagement with your computers to virtual reality and augmented reality. This is something that we will be able to use in the operating rooms, in radiology, in, the, uh, in teaching. So our paradigms of teaching, especially for surgery, the see one, do one, teach one, is not really adequate. The other uh, par paradigms on how we look at the problems, uh, they are very, still will be very useful. You can actually translate it into AI. However, this is not very useful for catastrophic complications that where you cannot predict it. So society is asking us to have simulators for surgery uh, that where you can go and practice the different procedures similar to the aviation simulators. And we have, we're moving in that direction. We have different ones. Even we're working very hard and obtaining haptic feedback. However, we're not really there yet. <laughs> Remote mentorship. This is something that we will see uh, uh, really developing very quickly. Uh, here you have the translation of information using the HoloLens. Uh, and uh, I don't know if you realize, but the guy passing the information is really a holograph too. Uh, this is nowadays, actually, this video is over six years old. So it is difficult to make predictions, especially of the future. Who would have thought 50 years ago that we would be seeing driverless cars in our roads? Did, did you anticipate this? Did you, did you think that you, we were gonna see it in our lifetime? So if you didn't, what about this? Flying cars. I don't know if you realize, but these are already commercialized. Commercialized. You can go and buy one of, some of this, not all of them. Uh, so this is gonna be here very, very soon. So the bottom line is that our future is already here. It's really not distributed equally. Some of us will have things that other ones are not gonna have. And again, if you see that curve of diffusion innovation, it will take us a while to get there. So maybe we have to reassess our goals as we go, and we have to reassess them quickly. 
I think that you can read this much faster than what I can, but these are uh, 10, uh, 10 tips uh, coming from Steve Jobs on how you can reassess your goals as you go and be more productive. Drivers of happiness. So as I tell you all this, I told you what, how, what the there was going to be. So the there is, is this. It's how to achieve fulfillment, mastery of your skills, autonomy, lack of economic hazard. Yes, we, we need a stable uh, uh, salary and a stable influx of money so you don't have to think about it. And you can see here that many experts agree that money, more money doesn't make, make you happier, but the lack of money really makes you more miserable. So this is important. And last, legacy. So I was talking last night over, over dinner, uh, and somebody have quoted that there are three things that you seek as you, in your professional life. You seek money, power, and legacy. At the end, legacy is the most important. As you end your career, I guarantee you that you won't think power will not stay, money will come and go, legacy is what you leave behind. So I'm going to leave you with a final thought. Uh, this is a quote from, um, from Warren Buffett, the Oracle of Omaha. And he says that in every cycle, and he's talking about business cycles, but it applies to any cycle. There are three eyes, the innovators, the imitators, and the idiots. Which one are you going to be? I have a fourth, is the idol. It's the one that really doesn't participate in the process. They just complain about it. So. Again, I hope that you join the innovators, or at least the imitators, uh, because I will be an active user of our technology. Finally, I'm going to leave you with this uh, picture. This is an artwork by Penny Oliver. She's a, a, a famous artist in the skull based world because uh, she has produced several, several works of art with skull based theme. This is called Illumination. And they, she did this one for, especially for this uh, Congress. Uh, and it's a very appropriate because all want to become illuminated. And, and if we do, I think our future will be very bright. Thank you so much. Thank you. That was great. I'd just like to butt in for a quick second, Rick. On behalf of the North American Skull Base Society, I just want to recognize you uh, for your service, your leadership, and achievements during your year as president uh, this past year. Under Rick's guidance, our society is as strong and healthy as it's ever been. So, Rick, we appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you.